I'm here at the Academy Art Museum in Easton, Maryland with uh, Emily Lombardo. Emily, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. We are just delighted with this uh, exhibition, uh, The Capriccios with uh, Goya and Lombardo. Mm -hmm. I uh, first, I guess, want to ask you how this came about. How, what drew you to this, uh, what drew you to this project? Well, you know, Goya has always been one of my great, my great inspirations in life as a young artist. You know, I was always really interested in pen and ink drawing and things like that. So as a young kid, I was always copying thing from, things from the newspaper, which really is very much in conversation with what Goya was doing, which is almost like the first political cartoons that we know about, right? So um, I had been working with a lot of different types of appropriation in my art practice prior to this. And during my MFA, you know, as an artist who's coming at this through a feminist lens, I was like, what better way to get attention to my feelings about our contemporary moment than appropriating the entire body of work of a very popular, loved white male artist. So that's, that was my entry point. And from there, I just went plate by plate. And you, you talk about copying and appropriating. Mm -hmm. This is a practice that actually is something that artists engage in from the very start, right? Yeah, you know, the, we always look at Warhol and Rauschenberg to those sort of things, but appropriation and this idea of like apprentice and mentor has been the way artists have learned how to do different techniques all throughout the history of art. You know, you have so many artists working as etchers and engravers who are engravers for Raphael or engravers for all these other artists and they are learning through copying and copying. So I feel like it's just embedded in us as learners. You know, we're, we're going to get into the exhibit in a minute, but mm -hmm. you do talk about in a statement that you made about this that you're investigating personal and cultural identity. I mean, this is really mm -hmm. uh, an exhibit with a purpose, if you will. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I really want this work to be able to be in tandem with Goya's work as almost an educational tool for people to look back at and refer to as we do with Goya's work to try to understand what was going on during his time in his culture and for people to be able to use that with this new version and be able to see what was going on during our time. And what was Goya trying to do? I mean, you know, Goya was, you know, coming at this from a very different position. So like if we're looking at, if we even really start with plate one, you know, which plate one is really the setup for me for the entire project. So, and you have this, you have this silhouetted self-portrait of himself and also me. And this is the idea that he's kind of setting the tone that he's looking, you know, kind of looking at his world and what you're about to get is his overview, right? So looking at his dress and the way that he's positioned himself, you know, he's got this kind of really kind of aristotic, you know, upper class look. He's got the tall hat. He's got like obviously a very nice jacket. So he's positioning himself in this way that represents the fact that he was a very well-desired, well-employed painter of his time. As we know, we're, we're all familiar with Goya's paintings, you know, and he positions himself as the painter, you know, in the title. It's like Goya, the painter. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he set out to make this work and there was a lot of conversation that he was ill and he had this all this time in bed. And during that time, he was looking at what was going on in France during the, I'm sorry, in Spain. <laughs> it was good. in Spain. Spain right. um, during what was the enlightenment for the rest of Europe, but in Spain they were having the Inquisition and, you know, the king and queen and the aristocracy were like out of control and so was the church. So he, while he was employed by those people and he was able to live very comfortably because of it, he decided to set out to make this work that would be definitely taking a dark look at what was going on during his time. So. I set up my, myself and my self-portrait to kind of show myself as a working class female artist without mm -hmm. the same sort of backing behind me as Goya potentially, right? My hat is smaller, I'm wearing a, tea, I'm wearing a, a tank top t-shirt, you know, which and kind of just like a thrown together scarf, you know, so obviously our dress is different. So I'm, I'm trying to just show issues of class there. And then I'm also positioned myself as a printer, which really sets the tone for my point of view, you know. So printmaking is always this way of creating work that can be a, 
obtained by multiple people and as a way of communicating to the masses. So both me and Goya were setting out to make a project right. that was communicating to the masses, but unlike him, I positioned myself more as a member of the working class masses. And he, he finished his work in 17... 1799, yep. and you began yours? I began mine in 2013. Okay. Yep, and the time frame they say for Goya was a three years on his working project, and this is his first etching project, and also mine, and it also took three years. So I started in 2013, and I finished in 2016, right before the election. Just before the election. Yep. Well, let's get into it. Let's go, cool. let's, uh, let's visit the <clears throat> exhibition, if, if you will. Sure, let's go in there. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, the first plate, and it's interesting to know that that was something that he kind of put in as one of the la last plates that he did. Um, so when we're looking at, you know, the overview of all 80 plates, he didn't do them in order, I didn't do them in order, and there's really no logical linear quality to the work. You can mm -hmm. enter into the work at any plate. You don't mm -hmm. have to go from 1 to 80. Um, but oftentimes the work is broken up into two movements. And those two movements are plate 1 to 42, which is all prior to the sleep of reason, and then 43 to 80. Okay. So prior to 42 is what they call the waking mo movement. So the things you see, people and figures and characters you see represented in the waking movement are more recognizable. Um, you know, they're, they don't take on the grotesque quality that happens after the sleep of reason. So as you can imagine, in the sleep of reason, he and I are falling asleep and these daily observances go into more of a nightmarish realm. So that's one way of really looking at breaking it into two sections. And, and I heard you describe this as kind of a conversation as you looked at his work and then and then developed your thinking. You were trying to reflect what he had in his plate, not necessarily mm -hmm. duplicate it, but, right. but bring about your sense of what was happening that could be represented mm -hmm. in, your own, in your own work, right? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the overarching the overarching thing throughout every single plate, the theme, the motif, is abuse of power in every single plate in some way or another. It's how we always, as a society, are always creating hierarchy and the violence and the poverty that kind of comes from hierarchy. So, like, through that lens is this abuse of power. You know, that's how I entered into each plate. I'm pretty sure that's what he was considering for each one of them as well. Should we select one? from the exhibit and maybe look at it and talk about it sure a bit. yeah um you know i was thinking we could look at uh plate 11 which is the lads making ready um just to kind of start to look at how i work with different figures throughout the course of the project um this is one of the earlier plates that i made and as we're looking at goya's this is very kind of human, humanistic moment where the, pe the Spanish soldiers are taking a break from the war that they've been in forever. You know, these kind of forever was forever war for them. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, our perspective now, I have also have soldiers taking a break, having food, writing letters, and this idea in my project though is to show this large span of time of war that's been going on since Goya to me. So if we're looking at the plate, the person in the foreground on the left is a soldier that's representative of a soldier from Desert Storm in the Iraq, like more of a, a desert war. Then to the right, we have more of a Vietnam styled fighter. And then towards the back, you start to get into World War II and World War I. And then you kind of see this contemporary drone flying in the background so looking at how much war has really evolved during our time and this idea that even while the soldiers are taking a break in our contemporary moment we still have we still have plenty of ways to be continuing the war and soldiers that are made of basically technological robots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you'll see that throughout a bunch of different plates like plate 34 employs the same sort of the same sort of tactic where we're in a prisoner, we're in with a bunch of prisoners of war, and those prisoners of war are spanning a variety of different times. 
but in the background of this plate, you're getting more of a panopticon war effect where, you know, or I mean, sorry, panopticon like prison effect where you're always mm -hmm. being watched, which is a very contemporary way of creating a jail. How, did, how was this work produced? How did you produce this? This is a, an etching? Yeah, so all of these pieces are copper plate etching. So mm -hmm. we're basically starting with a raw piece of copper that's a nine by six. And, you know, for me, I draw every single, every single plate, mm -hmm. then flip it and transfer that onto, onto the copper, use a needle to go through the ground, put that in the acid, etch it, and then... Once you have the line etching, then you have the aqua tint, which is a, the grain that's applied to the surface, which is where you're seeing tone in all of the plates. So it's extensive. And so there's a, a set of the work here. Are there there are multiple sets of this? Yeah, this is an edition of twelve. Edition of twelve. Yeah, okay. with a couple of artist proofs and printers proofs and gallery proofs. And then how about Goya? How many did? did you so think Goya's, made? you know, Goya releases, a, an amount of them. I think about. 30 of them when when he first releases them outside mm -hmm. in a perfume shop across from his studio that's the rumor anyway um in madrid and a bunch of them got bought and but then he pulls them off within a couple of weeks because he's worried about what's going to happen to him with the inquisition so he pulls the plates off and then years later in like 1804 i think mm -hmm. the king of spain purchases all the plates and all of the all of the existing copies. So this is why you can go to the Prada Museum in Spain and they have all the plates and Goya's Capriccio's and the Disasters of War and all of his other plates have been produced hundreds and hundreds of times because they were not his property. Sure. So they continue to produce them to. until the copper was almost worn down to nothing. Wow. So there's hundreds is the, is the short answer. Wow. Yeah. Well, so we're about at the midpoint of this. Should we? So, move well, I was going to backtrack to okay. um, 18 and 20 okay. and just kind of show yeah. where things are attached. So 18 through 20 um, is getting to this abuse of power in the church, which was very much obviously a major issue for, for Goya and a major issue for our time. So in 18, I've kind of inserted more of a... Uh, a coach figure kind of thinking about how a coach very much takes on to the role the role of priest in a lot of mm -hmm. communities that we're dealing with today so that's kind of what's happening in 18 is we have this questionable coach kind of coming from the background or background where something is going on and then for 19 and 20 um this is kind of dealing with the issues of the Catholic sex abuse scandal and reinserting, you know, it said my birds of prey or our priests as birds of prey. And there is this revenge, kind of this revenge fantasy that gets played out at the bottom of plate 19 and continuing into plate 20. And these were particularly difficult plates to make a translation to with Goya's. I think they really stand out in Goya's project his his original etchings i was really struggling with these this area because i was like they're maybe the most violent of mm -hmm. all of the plates mm -hmm. um and then when this connection came clear for me it just seemed really really seemed like the perfect correlation um i also bring up issues of other religions particularly the flds um which is a very much an american an american religion right the the Mormons, right. uh, but these are like the, what does the FLDS stand for? I always forget. It's like the, the Latter-day Saints, Saints, but they're like the major Orthodox right. ones, right. you know. Um, so that is plate, like plate 14. We have a, mm -hmm. that shows... You know, this mm. very young girl about to get married to this older man. So the, we talk about, you know, this outrage of like young women in different countries getting married in this way. But this happens in the United States a lot. You know, this, it's actually very prevalent. So that's what 14 and um, plate 31 also kind of touches on that, you know, because in plate 31, they are getting her ready or they pray for her so one woman is like preparing her long braided hair 
and you know she looks like she's maybe excited about what she's going to do but it's also thinking like these are communities of women that really have to kind of band together to take care of each other no matter what the difficult circumstances are so kind of looking at it from that perspective so religion definitely pops up in those in those plates and then as you and then as you move in i think you said it was past 43 mm-hmm. yeah. as you move how does this change now how do how, what's the well when we start moving into well we can backtrack a little okay. we can backtrack a little bit okay um because i wanted to touch on plate 26 okay. and plate 53 which is okay. talking about the kind of corruption or the excesses basically the excessiveness of the art world so i guess this is an important part of the project to show that i'm kind of revealing this system that i'm part of or mm-hmm. trying to become part of or definitely working within so um you know 26 is in reference to that famous work of art that Maria Abramovich did where she sat in the MoMA and people came and it's, the artist is present was the name of, of the work. And she was there for, I'm going to say s- several weeks or at least a week. Um, and people would line up to sit across from her and stare into her eyes and this idea of like how amazing it must be to have this much time. So for in this particular plate i have her sitting across from james franco who is probably their moment together at the momo was very publicized and you know this idea that these people of privilege have so much time that they can just sit there and stare into each other's eyes while in the background of the plate you have day workers and people that are actually struggling to make a living you know which is very much in conversation with goya's plate which is kind of funny with these kids wearing the chairs on their heads he was talking about these kind of really spoiled kids so we're kind of dealing with that you know spoiled kids of the art world of all ages in 26 and the same thing and this kind of pops into 53 where we're looking at um what a diamond skull which is the scenario where you know in Goya's, it looks like there's a bunch, bunch of people at a meeting where they're all kind of gathered around this this false idol or this academic that's supposed to be giving them some great some great knowledge. But if you really look closely at the figures in Goya's plate and in mine, it's supposed to look at closer look. You see that people are really actually sleeping, you know. So this idea that at the time I made this, I was in my MFA, so obviously you hear about. Jamie and Hearst a lot, but this idea that, you know, we're all kind of in awe of these art, these major art stars, but really the work might be a little sleepy, you know. And again, James Franco is positioned across from me in that plate, sleeping through his classes in Columbia. (laughs) Very dramatic. Yeah, very. And you, and you, and this is a case too, where you, in 53, you, you, the title is similar, but not identical. Right, yeah. yeah. There's a very there's a couple of plates, very few where I change the text. Uh-huh. Generally, the text is an Eng- just an English translation of Goya's Spanish texts. Mm-hmm. But if we're about to go into the world pr- um, post the Sleep of Reason, um, you'll start to see through plate thirty seven, up until forty two, Goya is doing a very big movement there, where he starts to do the apomorphic business so it's almost like he's starting to fall asleep if you look at it that way you know and like so looking at the change prior to really um 37 you know it you it's mostly all people you know you're seeing recognizable human figures and then after 37 we're seeing you know people that are animals people that are goblins or just kind of horrifically old wizened people um so he's, you know, in his funny, like, this is kind of the funny set, the 37 through 42, where he's, you know, with 37, he's starting a conversation, he's having a conversation about miseducation and this idea that, you know, if you don't teach children well and education is not of value in a culture that you're going to continue to breed ignorance and, um, you know, you're not going to have a culturally enlightened group of people which is what he was hoping for so in 37 i'm kind of also talking about this idea of teaching creationism you know so this 
you know, kind of letting science go and just referring only to the Bible. Some of these, uh, some of these creatures are involved in education. Some in healthcare, right? Yes, yes. Some in education. Some in healthcare. He he uses a lot of. Um, you know, the ass appears in many ways, and those are appearing as political figures. And, the, you know, plate 42, he's doing this thing where, you know, Goya shows this in his paintings as well, where he, to show hierarchy, he literally puts people on top of people, you know, like it, without any confusion there of what he's trying to talk about. So these are literally people riding each other for power or even if it's just a little bit of power. And then we go into the sleep of reason, and that's, you know, pretty, that, that is the most popular one. And, you know, there's the frontispiece that is in the um, show here is based on Goya's original drawing for this, for the sleep of reason. So the sleep of reason was originally going to be plate number one, but in his normal way of trying to trip everybody up and trying to read this straight in a linear way, right. he took it and he put it in at 43. He didn't put it in at 40, <laughs> put it in at 43, so very, very tricky. Um, but we, essentially he and I are mirroring each other in this, you know, where the artists are the authors of the work and we're falling asleep. But I've really gone to more extreme lengths to position myself in a very, more of a very feminine outfit, which would make it seem like I'm falling asleep because I don't really dress like that very much. So it's very fantasy. Um, and then I'm dealing with, you know, the elephant as a political symbol and just kind of also the more of this issue of women's rights, women's health, this question of fertility. You know, when you're having, if you're living in such a dark society, when do you decide whether or not to have children? So a lot of that is, is what I'm going for in this in this plate and in the frontis piece plate, which shows much more of like baby heads popping out. So a good example of like taking a recognizable figure and turning them into a flying demon um, would be 48 the tail bearers and this is an interesting plate so i've taken fred phelps from the westboro baptist church and i've really just turned him straight into this flying goblin that we see again in one of the other plates um and he is literally like spewing hate speech down on me and um the printer of my work so i used they agreed to model for for the plate so it's actually really kind of bringing it in full circle so this is the person that I worked with in producing the yeah. plates and is the person that does the additioning for the whole project now. So here, Fred has <laughs> turned himself into a monster. Not, not a, and this is the kind of idea that we're reveal, like these dream plates are supposed to kind of reveal the even darker mm -hmm. nature of these, mm -hmm. of the figures within. So you see, like, people do evolve from pre sleep of reason to after. And then that moves right into 49, um, which has, you know, again, the abuse of children, in this case, using them as soldiers. And we have the two children on the left, and they're, as you kind of would expect, they have guns, you know, they have this power they don't even know what to do with, because that's what they've been taught to do. And then the young child on the right is actually one of the kids from the Westboro Baptist Church. So without writing anything on her plaque, the idea is that we can kind of assume that she's a, she's a soldier for hate, you know, in this way, that she doesn't even know what she's really doing at that age. You know, it's, it's very powerful. Are these images coming to you out of things you're observing in... You know, news, I, or yeah. are they, or are it's they all in news. It's all okay. in news over time. Like yeah. I always have been, like I said, with reading the paper and even just looking at the paper. Like right. I'm not a huge, huge reader, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I always say that unlike Goya, you know, he had this, he had the ability for fantasy, at least when he was working in this project. I think the disasters of war really beget, he gets to a really different place because I think he was seeing some things. I think a lot of it was also a fantasy, but I feel like in our, in my current historical moment, I have no option for fantasy. There is no plate that I couldn't look at and think of something that's really happened, no matter how dark it is. Yeah. 
Yeah. The uh, played fifty two, which involves uh, an astronaut. I guess yeah. there's always one that grabs me. Yeah, I mean, this is a great example of how you know, as Americans, we rally around around these ideas or these concepts, which are so amazing and how we can be kind of controlled politically you know by them and this idea of this the space race awesome like astronauts and going to the moon are really really cool but it was also a way to kind of further this competition with russia and it also really pushed our missile technology further so there was a lot more than just going to the moon you mm -hmm. know there's a lot of other things behind the scenes You know, and then I have in plate 55, um, Until Death, this is one of the later plates that I did, and it's really talking about the corruption in the music industry, and just, you know, in all <clears throat> industries, but particularly in the music industry and the way that pharmaceutical companies and doctors can be convinced with the right amount of money from not only the art, the musical artists, but potentially people that want to see them continue to perform and just give them what they want. So this is the idea of like, people being over-medicated. With tragic results. With tragic, very tragic yeah. results, you yeah. know, and that's a whole, you know, it's a huge issue. 62 is one of the, one of the last plates I did as well, and I mean, it's a, kind of a classic wrestling match between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Um, and you know, you'll see in so many plates, I can't even write down how many of them, but the bald eagle is in all of them, and obviously it represents America and this country. Um, and I do position this whole work as being very American, just as Goya's work was very much Spanish. Um, and this is an interesting plate to think about the switch of having made it before the election and making the whole thing a little bit darker than I had expected it to be <laughs> as a hopeful person. <laughs> Can I take you back to um, 59? Sure. With this um, kind of remarkable wall. And... Yeah, 59 and um, this actually also ties into to 73 is um, do deal with issues of climate change and my work, which is completely, uh, wasn't even on Goya's radar, but it was something I knew was important for us to get into this project because our whole world is so surrounded by piles and piles of items, so many items, um, like we've taken, you know, consumerism and gluttony to a level that I don't think Goya could have ever imagined. But this is very much thinking about these like fly, like floating, islands of trash that are in the ocean and it's how people are often kind of sometimes people get into these kind of hoarding cultures um, and that you know people in different countries are going through trash as like their daily job so thinking about these huge massive mountains that we see of trash on tv and in documentaries mm -hmm. and then 53 you know goes a little bit further on that idea of like we don't really want to see it and we don't want to think about it. So 53 is titled, It's Better to Be Lazy. And it shows in the Mars. foreground. 73. Sorry, sorry, 73. 73. Okay. Um, shows in the foreground, you know, two people casually riding on an oil barrel, toasting to some champagne as if they were in a yacht, while you have the sand polar bear in the background on this tiny little disappearing ice pad. So yeah, it's again, it's the climate control or the no climate. And this fi the final phase here, um, I don't know, I guess the um, 76 is, a, is striking to me. Mm. Have... Yeah, 76 is one of the first oh, really? plates that I made when I started this project. And it's one of the few that I use like an actual cartoon character mm -hmm. in it where I use like the spy versus spy guy in the background, which is kind of funny. Um, and this was really right when Kim Jong-un was first, mm -hmm. come, he was first put into power in North Korea and he was kind of systematically um, 
making his the heads of his military disappear because they were the people that were threatened and were going to threaten his power as a young as a young leader at that time. So he's kind of in the background while one of his military leaders is like going on and on about like this and that and this and that and he's kind of in the background like <laughs> um, and obviously this continues to be a huge issue today. So take us through to the end and then we'll... Do so you want to go to the last plate? Sure. Or, you know, yeah, we'll pop, we could pop over to pop? the last, or do you want to add, talk about any other ones? But it's 78. 78. Yeah, 78 it's is going back to this, uh, you know, this idea of child workers and child labor, you know, all over the world. Um, those are basically kids that are forced to, like, clean and work in all these different, you know, as household, as household workers while they're not in school, which is really what every child should be doing at that age. At 79, you're... 79. Dealing with the goblins? Or yeah, the... 79, you know, and 79. This, You know, at this stage, too, with the whole, you know, second movement is that the light is starting to be revealed. So you kind of notice that the plates become lighter and, like, the daytime is, like, things are starting to show in the light of day again. So that's kind of this idea that we go from light to dark, kind of back to light again. And, you know, very much positioned 78 and 79 next to each other because 78 is showing like these children that are living a completely different lifestyle than the kids of 79 which are basically you know no one has seen us is showing a group of kids on like spring break just really taking their parents money or being very very excessive with what they're doing and excessive partying and drinking but also acting like nobody knows what's going on when everybody can see you there's social media everywhere mm -hmm. so you're not really hiding <laughs> you know yeah, right <laughs> you're, you're really on display which right. is maybe what they want to be i don't know um so then we go into the final plate and that one this was also one of the very last plates that i did and i don't think i could have done it at any other point in the project because it was i really needed to see the full breadth of it um and goya has quite a lengthy bit of writing about or the writing about these this Goya's plate is quite extensive and what he's saying is like now the light of day has been revealed and the goblins have to go away and imagine what it would be like if people could really see could really see these goblins and then maybe it would they wouldn't keep coming back um which is very much what I'm doing with my final plate but instead of using goblins I've used these historical vessels I've created historical vessels of fascism, abuse of power, um, racism, and gluttony, you know, so you see these figures here and they're, they're hollow, so they have no eyes, and this idea that every generation, they, we as people, for worse, continue to reinvigorate these issues of fascism and racism and just complete gluttony on each other. So the hope with this project is that we study it, we see, and we see the connection between Goya and we see like, okay, 300 years or so, and we continue to keep doing this. So maybe someday we will stop invigorating these, these kind of machines for hatred and abuse. You know, I've, I've heard you say as we walk through the exhibit that you're a hopeful person. And, yeah. and I think and it comes through in the, as you talk about it, yeah. even though you, you hit us with some pretty powerful images. Right, and I think, you know, I think Goya was too, you know, like I think it's this, it's the responsibility of artists, no matter how hard it is to show what is happening in our in our culture and the hope that we stop making these continued mistakes. And maybe that's what makes us human and we won't, but maybe or maybe they'll change and they'll shift. Obviously, they will shift over time. But, you know, with these kind of dark, dark projects we know there must be some sort of a light. You know, we do live a life that is not all dark all the time. You, um, you have in your statement on your site a, a phrase that I wanted to share and, and maybe close with or get you to comment on mm -hmm. because it hit me as <clears throat> something that is very, very appropriate given when, after one walks through this. But you, you, you write that these acts of appropriation are prescriptive they unmoor the structure of identity to which I have felt victim, just as a small dose of disease can also be a cure. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And it made me think that, well, maybe you've given us an artistic vaccine, if you will. I love that. To, to yeah. fight some of these things that are influencing us to this day as they were in Goya's time Absolutely. back in 1799. I feel that. I think that's a perfect way of describing it. And I feel that as an artist, for me to grapple with it helps make me stronger. So that's how that, you know, that vaccine is, is working on me today. <laughs> well, good. Well, Emily, thank you for being with us here at the Academy Art Museum. Thank you for this uh, wonderful wonderful exhibition and uh, something that's uh, thought-provoking for all who see it. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks.